On Black Narcissus, we all expected to go on location to India. And we were greatly surprised when Michael Powell, the director, told us the entire film was going to be made at Pinewood Studios in England. After the film was released, I believe Mickey got a letter from someone in India who said that they knew the locations, they'd seen them. <laughs> Every time I saw the Arches logo, I knew I was in for something special. Then I saw the name Cardiff, Cardiff attached with that. And I knew that this was a very, very uh, unique, uh, uh, I was about to undergo a very, very unique experience. And so in a funny way, um, uh, I became very much aware of his name. Jack Cardiff happened to uh, fall into their laps at uh, just the time when they were making three of their greatest films, A Matter of Life and Death. Black Narcissus and the Red Shoes, and uh, of course contributed so enormously to those three great films. In Black Narcissus, we had a studio product that uh, actually looked better than if they had done it in the Himalaya Mountains, you know. The medium of expression, the color cinematography, and the script and the acting are very much all of a piece. It's, it's a perfect English melodrama. I was most impressed because uh, that he, he gave me half of my performance with the lighting. <laughs> Light comes through the front, obviously through the lens, and there's a prism here, which is a very, this is the soul of the Technicolor camera. 25% of the light comes straight through the prism onto the one film in this gate here. That's the green record. And then the other rest of the light, 75% of the light comes through and is reflected onto a bipack. This is a bipack of the red and the blue records. And of course, the magazine holds three films. The cameraman used to receive, after each day, um, the three negatives, the three um, primary negatives, one color picture uh, to give him a guide how he was doing. The camera itself was quite reasonable, but the blimp to keep the noise down was enormous. It was um, probably over four foot high and at least about two foot wide and very heavy. When you see how big that thing was, how they did it, I don't know. I mean, they did call it the Enchanted Cottage because it was so huge. These Freeless Prockets, they do nothing except that. But I used to put on this Bay Act and say, I think I'll put a bit more green here, a little less uh, blue there. And they believed it. They thought I was creating color with the camera. It's terrific stuff. At the end of the picture, the cameraman would collect these, put on one sheet, or Technicolor would do it for him. I have several, and they're great fun to look at them. I think one has to understand at that time films were still into, I'll put, I was going to say films were still entertainment as opposed to today. No, today they're entertainment too. But at that time they were coming out of the old Hollywood system and there was a, you know, there were westerns, there were genre films. And a Technicolor was used for heightening the genre in the 40s and 50s. Color was still relegated to films as a special element rather than what happened in the late 60s and the early 70s where all films became color. Over here, we use Technicolor mostly for uh, musicals and big outdoor pictures. And the producers wanted all the color they could get because it cost them, I believe it was about 25% you added to your budget to get Technicolor.
I saw it as a wonderful exercise for all for all of us to produce a, a real perfect colour work of art. I found out that Technicolor people had come over to interview the operators at Denham to choose one young operator to be trained in Technicolor. And some operators that had already been in for this interview, and they came out shaking because the technical questions were absolutely very, very tough. So when it came to my turn, I said right away, well, I'm afraid that on the technical side, I'm absolutely zero, and there's a shock silence. And they said, well, how do you, how do you think you're gonna get on in the film business? And I said, well, I study painting and light and light in buildings and so on. And they asked me which side of the face did Rembrandt light. I took a chance on that one and said this side, and of course it would be reversed in an etching. And then I talked about Peter de Hook and his interiors and the camera obscura and that stuff. And uh, the next day I learned that I had been chosen. Michael always talked to me when I first met him about how Jack had begun in the Technicolor plants and he knew the process from the inside out. And since Michael wanted to use it in a unique way, it was definitely clear that Jack was the man for him. It was a wonderful combination because you had Michael, as I said, who was uh, daring and running around and doing outlandish things. And Emmerich, who was a brilliant writer anyway, he would be the, the one who occasionally would say to Michael, well, I think this is going too far because of this or that. And he'd usually be right. Michael, Emmerich, and Jack all had very strong visions. And you know, that's always wonderful when, when uh, you have people with, with that powerful force running through them. British cinema during the 30s and 40s had a reputation amongst uh, British filmgoers and also certainly amongst foreigners of being terribly kind of polite and genteel. Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger would have none of that. They were interested in emotion being explored and uh, exposed. You're sure there's no question you're dying to ask me? None. But they were trying to find a proper way, if you like, for English emotions to be revealed uh, and, and on the screen. I think you have let yourself fall into thinking too much of Mr. Dean. Sister, don't you realize what you're doing? What you're running the risk of losing in yourself? Sister, you must, I must make you see before it is too late. All the same, I've noticed you're very pleased to see him yourself. If that was in your mind, it's better said. I think you're out of your senses. I was fairly stroppy and I had my own views about how to play Sister Ruth. She didn't always agree with Mickey's. So we had one or two rows about it and on one occasion, um, Mickey walked off the set and Jack came up and said, uh, are you ready now? What do you want us to do, Mickey? And, and Mickey said, she'll tell you. So, <laughs> so Jack came up to me and said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I thought I'd do this and that and so on. So we set it up and um, then Jack called Mickey back and said, uh, do you want to see what we've arranged? He said, no, shoot it. And when they shot it, he said, well, it wasn't what I wanted, but it's very good, print it. <laughs> so that went off quite smoothly. Good evening. Sister Ruth? I can't stand it any longer. I left the order. I gave up my vows. I finished with them up there. Whatever Mickey did was extremely creative and original. And he had this wonderful backup of this fantastic cameraman. He collected around him the best technicians that were available, and he had a brilliant art director, Alfred Junger, a German who was quite brilliant, and he used to make the most wonderful sketches. Alfred Junger, the designer, and Jack Carter, the cameraman, would have endless arguments and 
conversations about the settings. First of all on paper and then when they're painted, then in detail and then when the set was there. And he was, I would say, Teutonic in his um, method of talking to me about the way that the, his, his set should be lit. And I was a little bit overawed by him. Sometimes Alfred would have to tear half of it down. Jack pointed out that the kind of lighting that he wanted for this particular sequence couldn't be done because there was a wall in the way. Alfred would be furious. But together, they just worked miracles. I mean, you never get the slightest feeling of studio, do you? This set there was literally a few yards away from the studio in the lot, and it was built on rostrums about over oh, six feet high. So when she fell off, she was literally falling on six feet instead of 300 feet. And Papa Day did the painting, point of view painting, of the valley as seen from them. It was brilliant at it. He painted absolute per perfect pictures, looking almost like a photograph. This is the famous shot when uh, I shot with a number two fog filter. It's so unnoticeable, you know, but Technicolor were outraged because that was forbidden at that time. And the next morning we got a note from Technicolor, a message on the phone to say that the previous day's work was completely ruined. And I felt sick. And they said it was, they knew it was important because it was Deborah's last day on the film. So we trooped in to see the, the rushes they'd brought over specially to show us. And the moment I saw it on the screen, I knew it was good. And Michael said, wonderful, Jack. This is just what I wanted. And he turned to Technica. He said, it's about time you learned something about art, art and, and movies and so on. He was, gave him a lecture. Technica, it was a very exacting process. And that's why there was someone on the set all the time. There was a certain tyranny about the color consultants and Mrs. Kalmus, who was the wife of Dr. Kalmus, who had brought the process out, uh, she was in charge of making sure that all the sets, the, the colors were right, and even white shirts had to be dipped in dye so that they, they, they were graded from one to five so that they weren't too glaring white. But Mrs. Kalmus was quite a dictator, and she used to come on the set with the most incredible clothes of the brightest colors, really Technicolor colors, and uh, say to the art director, no, this wall is, is too blue or too green. I must have it a little less this and that. And she'd redesign everything. That's why I don't think she ever came on the set with Michael Powell. I think he would have thrown her out. And also, um, also Alfred Junger, the art director, would never agree to the, his colors being changed. There was something very, very special and unique about the English use of Technicolor, particularly uh, by a man like, uh, like Cardiff. And that became something else, and that had a lot to do with emotion, I think. It had more to do with painting. Not to say that the, that the American uh, cinematographers didn't use painting. Of course, they were, they were brilliant. Uh, but um, how should I put it? That was a, a different type of commodity. That's good, that's good, that's good because it, that gets the menace, I think, it's slightly darker and colder. Light is a principal agent and um, that should be the same with photography, that the use of light, like a painter, that you use it in a simple form. Vermeer and Rembrandt, of course. Vermeer was the sort of painter that I had in mind on Black Narcissus because the, the light had to be clear and, uh, and uh, as simple as possible. But it's easy to say, do it like Vermeer, but then people forget that the actors move around. 
they get in the lights, they get in the way. It's great to do a still picture, but um, the cameraman often has to start on a close-up and track back. The same principle, that, of course, Rembrandt used it, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, and it's extraordinary how effective it is and how simple it is, you know. And this next painting here, you've got a typical cameraman's lighting, isn't it? Except that it's uh, more beautiful than most effects I've seen or done. It's just superb, isn't it? Of course, in, in a film story, you very rarely have the opportunity to have the actors so dark as that. Sometimes the director would say he'd like to see more of the artist's face. The producer would sack you, wouldn't he? Yes, that's right. <laughs> The same kind of emotional and psychological connection that was made through certain lighting and paintings, uh, I felt watching those pictures that he photographed. He made them special. Because of that, you wanted to be in that world with them. The normal color of the lips in Technicolor at that time was exaggerated because of the, the white nun's uh, outfit and so on. And so they looked like makeup. They, they, although they, there was no makeup on the lips, they looked like made up lips. So I suggested that we put flesh color on the lips, which we agreed, he, and he did it. And um, that made a big difference. And it made it all the more dramatic when Catherine, at the end of the picture, put this red lipstick on the lips. It was very clever to put the lipstick on without looking into a mirror. <laughs> getting it on the lips. But that was very dramatic, I thought. I think Michael Powell felt color was very much part of the narrative. And for example, there are, sometimes when I talk to film students, I, I show them uh, sequences that were deeply uh, impressive to, to Scorsese, for example, about how emotion is expressed through color. You say that because you love her! I don't love anyone! When I saw their work on screen, this was like being bathed in color. It was palpable. It was, it, I don't know what it, it, color, the color itself became the emotion of the picture. There's a famous picture by Van Gogh uh, in Arles, where he used to go to this cafe where they had a huge billiard table. And he went for the complementary colors he, with the green table and sort of reddish mm -hmm. lights around it. When I did this, this green, having green filters in the filler light and um, sort of pinkish colors and the, the sun effects. It was a thing of anger. I tried to use the same kind of mood in that, that I mean, any, any cameraman would get ideas from Van Gogh and moods of light. The entire sequence in which Sister Ruth tries to kill Deborah Carr, who's ringing the bell, was all uh, shot, designed and shot to an exact piece of music that had already been composed by Brian Easdale. And it's quite amazing when you look at it that way and you realize what Michael and Jack were doing. It's quite a feat. The whole communication of the film, what the film is trying to communicate, is combined through uh, costume, positioning of people in the frame, um, movement of people within the frame, sometimes movement of the frame itself, uh, light, shadow, color, and cutting, all to music. I thought I was just going out looking a bit malevolent, but um, when I saw it on the screen, uh, I was amazed at this great blare of music and this incredible face with the wet hair. It's true, my hair was wet and my dress was wet. It was soaking wet. And, uh, but the atmosphere that was created around me was, was fantastic. I was most, most inspired by it. We were so immersed in the subject of what to 
that we never thought of anything else until we came up with the finished film at the end. And uh, when our Arthur rang, and he took it to California, showed it in Hollywood, he got the most wonderful technical praise. You know, the art direction got two Oscars, the Jack Carter's photography got another Oscar. Usually you get Oscars if you're on a very big film. In the case of Black Narcissus, just to get the, the Oscar on the photography was very rare. I was delighted. Black Narcissus was the best calling card that a director of photography could have because these were films that were talked about everywhere that people talked about the, the craft of filmmaking. They had set new standards. They'd shown a fantastic versatility in using Technicolor using colour cinematography, which was admired all over the world. I went to Hollywood to uh, play in Young Bess and the taxi driver said, oh, you're the mad nun, aren't you, as I got in. It was, it, and that was years later. We were shooting a very important scene, which was the explanatory scene for the whole psychological reasons why things went wrong in the Himalayas. It was a wonderful scene. And the rain was coming down the windows, and I had shadows of the rain on all the faces, and it was the best, I think, the best photographic <laughs> scene in the picture. About a week or two later, a very rare occasion, we went on a location just near the studio, and the scene was that the nuns are leaving to go to Calcutta as the rains were about to break. Out of picture on the right-hand side were two fire engines uh, with the hoses all ready to shoot water up in the air, which would fall into the lake as torrents of rain came down on the lake. That was the shot. And I had an idea and I suggested it to Michael. Michael said, I love it, let's do it. So I was on a six-foot ladder and I had a cup full of water and I was going, Plop, 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 and then the camera pans up and you see this mass of water hurling down and that faded out. That was the end of the picture. And we saw the rushes the next day and Michael Powell said, what a wonderful shot. I love this shot. I'm going to, I'm going to, use this shot and cut out the other scene completely, which was my best scene photographically. I don't think Black Narcissus is old-fashioned at all. It's, um, it, it, it just seems to be real. Sister Ruth, <laughs> how nice to see you. Shall we go? Here's to Black Narcissus too. <laughs> Technicolor technician, when he traveled abroad, he was obligated and told definitely that he had to take it into his bedroom and sleep with it. What a sleeping companion that was. I think uh, young people, we have to keep making uh, films like this and we have to be out there drawing their attention to this use of uh, cinematography and color. Uh, in the old days, you know, that's what we're trying to do here with the with the with the photography of Jack Carter from people like him over the years. Mickey loved Jack. He was always saying to me, "I love Jack, don't you?" And I say, "Yes, he's wonderful." Sister Ruth, yes, going bonkers. 
I, w I wouldn't have cut off my ear like Van Gogh or anything <laughs> like that, but I would have liked to have been a successful painter. Something in the atmosphere that makes everything. like it, Sister Ruth? It's called Black Narcissus. It comes from the Army Navy stores in London.